I always feel guilty um, asking ladies to put the headphones on. <laughs> I, should yeah. I feel guilty or not? You should actually, because especially ones with long hair, because it's like, oh, you know, I'm going to take the headphones off. I'm going to have a pair of headphones sort of moulded into my hair. So I think you should feel exceptionally guilty. I'm looking forward. You to... won't look any different. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the day someone comes with an afro. Like, get, those he- <laughs> get those headphones. Get them on. Get those headphones on. <sighs> um, I have a question for you. Yeah. So, I so I again rightly or wrongly assume. People like you, so these ice water bathers, these uh, breathing experts, Wim Hof types, like disciplined, mindfulness, well-being, not freaks you, that's the wrong word, but you know, as you are, as you are, rigid with it, rigid with it. Uh, I thought you were all early risers. Uh, No. Um... (laughs) No, I don't want to be like everyone else. No, I'm I'm not. I'm I'm really trying to change that habit, but then I think why what am I changing it for? Am I changing it for because I think I should? Because all the yogi types get up early and go to bed at nine. Maybe I am just somebody who naturally is better going to bed at eleven, half eleven and waking up at seven. As long as we get our seven, eight hours or some decent sleep. But I am I am I'm experimenting with it. That's all I'm going to say. Getting up earlier. I changed about a year ago, I think. Maybe a year, two years ago. Uh, during the first lockdown, maybe. It does depend on people's lifestyles and, and what you do and what you need to do. Yeah, I mean, I'm out partying every night as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I, at revs. <laughs> <laughs> I changed to getting up at the time. I went to getting up at half five every morning I had a mate who, who was doing it he was getting up, he still does I think he's up at five every morning a young lad he served he served for four or five years in the military he's maybe 28 now but uh, like a shining example mm. of mindfulness well-being discipline just incredible like I, I, I look up to him in, in, mm. in that respect and what he does and he was he gets up at five and he's got a whole routine he does every morning for about three hours. Mm. And if, and he doesn't even pick his phone up, for example, until about eight AM. But he's got this whole thing, he writes in the journal, he does mm. some yoga, he gets up at five. And I started following his lead, I was getting up at half five and just trying to do nothing really mm. from half five. But my God, what a difference it makes. Now I, I love it. Because the only it from from my lifestyle and sort of routine, the only the only time I can guarantee it's my time. I'm not going to be disturbed. I can get, I'm, and it's I can, I'm in the worryless. Morning, is that time in the morning? Yeah, that time in the morning. It's yeah. just like you don't need to feel to be, need to feel to be rushing around anywhere doing anything. Get yeah. half five and do nothing. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. agree. I love it. I agree. So I'm. I am. It's in practice that bit. The rest I do have my routine. You know, so all of that is very much a part of. I have to have, and it is probably a couple of hours of. I don't even look at it as self-indulgence. So getting in the ice bath, so preparation before I get in, that could be going in an infrared sauna, sweating, exercise, sweating, getting in the tank, getting out, doing a bit of breath work, shower, ready, boom, done. So what's your what's your so every morning? Do you so what's your routine immediately before getting the ice bath? Do you do breathe? You do the breathing exercise. Yeah, breathing. If I if I'm short on time, only because I've done it for so long now. I don't really need to do that sort of whole prep thing like I did with you. Um, I've sort of already, uh, it's like an automatic thing now when I get in the tank. So if I'm short on time, then I don't do it. But if I think, no, I really want to get some, some, just some power in my body. Um, So I'm doing it more for that other than physiology, you know, physiology wise needing it. Do you treat it as a meditation then? The ice bath? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because there's, you know, the the I say it on every talk that I've done. There's when you first get in, there's nothing else you can think of other than shit. I've got to survive. This is really bloody painful. I've got to survive. So you've got to control the breath. You've got to have some internal control. You've got to bring your focus inside, and I like that. You know, for me, <clears throat> a lot of Coping with my anxiety has been, you know, to some people they are quite alarmed. Other anxiety suffers. They go, I could never do that because I'm too anxious. Well, you're exactly the person who needs to do it. 
So for me, it's when you get in, it's there's nothing else to think of. Focus on your breath. Bring everything under control. You can control your state. You can change that state from fear to complete surrender within a minute or two. You know, you've done it. It was cold when you got in. Made sure of that. It was very cold. So if you let your mind go, I cannot do this, and you start breathing wrong, it will go wrong. You're going to have to get out, or I'll have to get you out. So I like that element of discipline, and it is utter discipline that I have to control my mind and come into my body. And I do that with the breath work. Yeah, I th so the benefit for me, I think, with, with that kind of thing, is I do the same with a sauna, same with any, well, anything arduous and hard like that from some sports even, is what I like about it is it's not so much the focusing on the one thing, it's the not letting other things distract me mm. and and the anxiety and the worry piece and mm. uh yeah it, it, it yeah it is that focus it's switching everything else off mm. or i don't have to think about anything else there's no point about thinking anything else so even like with the ice bath for example <clears throat> sauna although it's not extreme as my experience in the ice bath is it's uh it becomes um the well you know the ice bath became uh what's the word well, relaxing. It was yeah. just, I was just such a relaxed state. Because in my mind, I, I didn't have a choice. Well, I've got to sit in yeah. here because Anna said, I'm in here. <laughs> I'm in here. I haven't got a choice. So there's no point in even considering anything yeah. else. Just get through it. Yeah. And when I got over that first minute yeah. of, oh my God, this is this is incredibly painful. And then he's into it. It was, yeah. I, I, yeah. Because it's... it's uh, you, you can't be in there, can you, going... Oh, and I'm really worried about that. The, the catastrophizer gets immensely quietened. And that's what anxiety... The catastrophizer. Suffers. Yeah, because we have catastrophic minds. Anxiety sufferers can be catastrophizers. <clears throat> and when I say that, that doesn't mean that in, in a belittling way, because it doesn't mean that we are little if you have anxiety. Generally, people with anxiety... You know, it's bloody hard living with anxiety. So for me... It's, it's generally the anxiety is feeding us lies. We catastrophize because of that. But when you get into that extreme cold, you can't be there going, oh, I'm really worried about what that person does. Oh, oh, no, I didn't do that yesterday. Oh, such and such is not feeling well. Oh, what if something happens to... You cannot. It's, it's like it shuts that down. And I love that. So to me, it is an addiction or a healthy habit. Let's use that word. What was your mind before it? Um, busy. But my mind will always be busy. You know, I'd be lying if I sat here today and said I don't still have a busy mind. This is a bit like somebody who who's very, very hooked on going to the gym and has to do that certain hit class six or seven days a week. For me, this is like my hit class. It it it's It is habitual for me. I, I am... If I don't do it, so like Sawney, I haven't been in, I will go in when I get back, whether it's pouring with rain or whatever, so I can just tick that box. Because it, it's it's my reset. It's it's sort of, it is part of my well-being, like you and I talked about when I, when I met you. Toolbox. I have a toolbox of things. The ice bath, the breathing, fitness. And I'm not talking extreme fitness. It could be going for a a really good fast paced walk with my dogs. It's not torturing myself in a gym or, you know, I've done all that over the past years. Not into that now. <clears throat> you know, it's more, <clears throat> it's very good for my mind discipline. So it's, it's also enabled me to believe that I am not my anxiety because I can do that. The same as when I've done those skydives. Yes, they are with a tandem. But now I want to move forward and try and really face the ultimate fear to teach myself to do it without a tandem. What does that give me? Lots of people go, you're absolutely bloody crazy. Uh, to me, it isn't crazy. To me, these things give me, they support me when I am in those situations where my mind could go and catastrophize, incessantly worry. You know, it is a form of OCD anxiety because we get that circular thinking. It goes round and round and round and round. 
But when I get in that ice bath, when I've done those skydive, when I've really stepped into those fearful states and managed to self-regulate myself, it's the same as when I had both my sons. I didn't panic. I just went completely, it's like I found this sort of thing inside of me. And again, that was all through the breathing, but I wasn't even aware of it all those years ago when I had my kids. But I controlled my breathing now when I look back. So my labours are really calm and I was very lucky. There was nothing too complicated going on. So I know that isn't the case for a lot of women. So, but I kept the control going even when I thought I'm going to lose my shit. I need to keep my breath controlled. So by having these bits in my toolbox I don't catastrophize as much anymore I don't lay awake at night anymore I don't struggle to go to sleep anymore so so how did you come to the point where you discovered a toolbox discovered ice water discovered the breathing I I mean the breath work I'd sort of been practicing for many years anyway because I did a bit of yoga um so more the pranayama <coughs> methods you know so which is more spiritual so when you go in the yoga classes you know they do um sort of pranayama breath which is all the really lovely modalities to help with anxiety but there's also really sort of quite uplifting breath practices as well so i've done a bit of it but then uh it's about lockdown the beginning of lockdown time we were all at home and i love to learn and this thing came up in my inbox, you know, Yoga Lap is starting a instructor course. So I'd already done a few of this guy's um, sort of courses as far as just for myself. But then I thought, wow, I'm going to be an instructor. This sounds great. And especially with the whole sort of COVID situation and it being a respiratory problem, it was more I wanted to learn and get the instructor course primarily so that I could support my loved ones if ever they were struck down with, with COVID or they were struggling with breathing issues. So I did that course and then I was doing the cold showers as was sort of loads of the country. You know, Wim Hof really sort of flew through the ranks. Really, It really got highlighted. Really? During the pun? Loads and loads of people I speak to now, they go, I haven't done an ice bath, but I started doing Wim Hof at the beginning of lockdown because it's all about immune boosting. Oh, I didn't realise that. Yeah, honestly, that, that is when... I didn't know he'd taken off like that. He really, it really started to take... He was big anyway, but... Yeah, it, big anyway, yeah, yeah. But he became legendary, almost, as COVID hit. Because we've all, you know, hopefully, got running water at home and can have a shower. Or we can find somewhere to get into cold water, whether that be a lake or whatever. So, I started doing the cold showers. And I thought, okay, so I'm just talking really gently, just putting the temp down towards the end. And I'd leave it on cold for when my husband got in on purpose. I'd hear, <laughs> ah, shit! Evil woman. Um, so, am I allowed to swear, by the way? Because I do swear a yeah, lot. Yeah, you can swear. Sorry. sorry. Um, I bet you don't swear as much as me. <laughs> and, <laughs> I do love to swear. And that's in my healing box, or toolbox. So, what is not swearing. Swearing is part of my toolbox. Yeah, is because, it? Yeah, well, I swear. A, it's like a, lancing a that, boil. It's that's the worst fantastic. excuse for swearing ever. Oh, it's in my mental health yeah, toolbox. It is. It is. <laughs> it is. If I feel anxious, I, I sort of get a bit of Tourette's. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> no, you better edit that bit. Um, so, yeah. And then I, me being me, I thought, okay, I'm not getting enough out of this now. It's too easy. And then I just started seeing more and more things about outdoor swimming, lake swimming. And then something again popped up on Instagram. I saw these tanks, thought I'm going to get a tank. I'll give it a go myself. So this would have been about November last year. And I'd already done a couple of Wim Hof courses online. So I had sort of all the fundamentals, let's say there. Done a 10 week course online with him. I had the breath teacher training um, that I'd passed really well so that was good and then I just started thinking okay well these two things work really well together because if I'm not breathing properly I'm not going to make it and it was probably about two degrees the first dip I did which was the coldest I've done actually biting I mean I was chipping the ice off the top oh my god and it was blistering snow outside the one day we had before Christmas and it was hilarious because I've got three men at home and they were included they were my sons as well and they were having their hot tea and bacon butties and you know their their <clears throat> mum's plodding down in through the kitchen with a swimsuit on 
and a bubble hat and it's blizzardous outside and I thought yeah this is it and that's the this first one you did yeah outside oh like my God, I would not have got in yeah I would not even no, got you would have you would I wouldn't you would not self-motivated like that I wouldn't you would you would, I don't doubt that you would have. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> no, you would. No, don't ever doubt yourself. So, my husband, I did have to get him to come outside with me in his, you know, warm coat. And um, just in case, because I thought, I don't know how I'm going to react, actually, at this extreme weather. So, I said, can you just keep an eye on me, just in case. So, he came out and I did two, three minutes of that. And that was... What was that like? Hell. Yeah, hell. But... Again, it was just controlling the breath. Did it ease off at all? Or did it, was it hell for the entire three minutes? No, it did ease off slightly. But the thing is, when you start going below three degrees, your hands and feet really do start to become quite painful. So that's why I say to people, don't get hooked up on timings and staying in for ages. You don't need to. You don't need to. So two degrees, two minutes is enough. So got out, started jumping around like a banshee. And then... <laughs> I just thought I've got the space at home. My husband had this man cave built in the garden. And I thought if I convert that a little bit and tweak it, I could use this <coughs> so I can run little mini retreats here. I can do one-to-ones. I can get the fires out, you know, really make this space at the bottom of our garden that is like just, it's got trees. It's It takes people away from modern life. For, even if just for a few hours, with a pinch of coal thrown in. How did your husband receive that that suggestion? He had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. No, no, no. When he had this man cave built, and, you know, I thought, oh, there's nothing feminine about that. How can I do... You know, I have men and women come to me, which I really love. So, you know, it's a it's a mutual place for anybody. You know, anybody can come. So, you know, it's not all pink and fluffy. I don't want it to be like that. But, you know, it was all golf clubs and memorabilia and it was very masculine. So he he was actually really good because he said, no, I want you to be able to use the <coughs> indoor space, especially in the winter. Whereas in the summer, I can do my retreats outside, you know, on the garden space. I want people to have the most pure experience. I don't want it to be too <coughs> modernised, meaning I don't want it to be I want I want us to feel like we're stepping back in time a little bit when people come through the door. Hence, I love getting the fires going, you know, getting the ice and the water and doing really, you know, quite strong breathing methods. Sitting around a fire and just talking without our mobiles on. You know, sharing food together, sharing life, sharing experiences, having a laugh. <laughs> that is what I want to create for people. And I know that that is certainly what has helped me. One, primarily because I love what I do. So it doesn't really feel like work to me when I do it. Very rarely have I had a day where I've thought, oh, I'm really not in the mood for this. There's generally something else going on for me. It's not the work. It's something else that my mind is being pulled to. And we all have that. But my work I love because I know how it makes me feel. And I know the things I've gone through to try and get the results that I now get with the work that I do. So it's like the, it's like the cream on top of the coffee for me. These two things. How long have you suffered with anxiety for? Uh, as far as I'm aware, um, and this is aware, when I first had a panic attack, I was uh, twenty twenty nine. So many many years. Um, you know, ten years. <laughs> How did the uh... no. Many years now. I'm not laughing about it. It was horrendous. How, how did it manifest itself? Um, it's not the same for everyone, is it? Tons and tons of stress. Two small kids. Husband was working away. I mean the panic attack. So literally like a surge coming through my body. Palpitations. You felt like the adrenaline was literally crawling up. You know, arm tingling. It was utterly horrendous. Horrendous. I had the op- one of my first one that I'm aware of. <clears throat> I had the opposite of that, I think, and my body, my body just started shutting down, and I went, I went, I went grey. I couldn't even speak. <clears throat> my, my my stomach wasn't nauseous, but it was just in knots, and all my my extremities started tingling. shutting down. Were they tingling, or was, uh, did they go? I, sort of, not did they I clamp recall. up? I remember not being able to do anything. I walked from where it started 
to my accommodation. I was working away at the time mm. to my accommodation. I didn't realize the color I was, and I walked in. Someone else said, "Fucking hell, mate, you're right." Without me even saying anything, they could yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I just dreamed, yeah. and I went. <clears throat> couldn't even speak to him. I went and just laid down, and I was in that. And I think that was the first panic attack. Yeah. Well, the first I was aware of, and then it was uh, the people about them. I don't even realize sometimes. I think. No, I mean I'd, I'd never get them anymore, but I do remember calling the doctors, or you know, was it one 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 back then? I can't remember, but saying. I feel like I'm having a heart attack. I don't know what's happening to me. I couldn't physically eat. I couldn't eat my stomach. I just the adrenaline. It was like an overdose of adrenaline coming through my body. But it, it was my it was my body's way of going. Enough. How long did it go? How long has it gone on for that? Like? Enough. Um, probably that I would get. I mean, I treated it. You know, I'm going to be open. I went to the doctors. I went on medication. I had counselling. Um, had lots of support. So the panic attack stage, a couple of months. Jesus. Yeah, a couple of months. But it wasn't every day. No, this wasn't every day. It was just generalised anxiety. So it wasn't where I was having a panic oh. attack every day. Once I started to just sort of calm down and that fear started to calm down. No, I've probably only ever had um, maybe a dozen panic attacks in my life. It's been more general it sort of just morphed into high anxiety. So it wasn't necessarily an attack, a panic attack, where you're blowing in a brown paper bag. It was just that very uncomfortable feeling in the body. So pins and needles in the hands, sick to my stomach, couldn't physically eat, could not sleep. So I was utterly exhausted, but I couldn't sleep. Just laid wide and awake. My, my husband would say, just, just switch off. And I'd be like, I can't. So your brain is just in that absolute just fight or flight. Yeah, survival mode. Yeah, you, you cannot switch it off. So, I mean, this is many, many years ago. So there's been loads and loads and loads of stuff that I've done. So was this, Sorry, was there situations that would bring it Was there specific things that would, that would bring it on to elevated levels? Or bring those attacks on or the increased anxiety or stress? Bring it on. I, th I think if you're not, look, I think for me it was more my body's way of saying you're doing too much for everybody else. You're not looking after yourself enough. Um, very negative self-talk. Um, trying to be a perfectionist. Also spending a lot of time on my own. My husband was away a lot. He what, was never home. What do you mean negative self-talk? You know, just saying, I'm not doing this good enough. I'm not good enough at this. Consciously say it to yourself. No, no, no. Just silently. You know, just, you know, when you wake up in the morning or if you do something, we, if somebody goes, oh, you did really well, you know, we have our silent sort of inner talk, don't we? So I call it my inner talk was very critical of myself. You know, and I know that stemmed from my childhood because I just thought, whatever I do, it's not going to be good enough. So I would keep on exhausting myself even more <clears throat> to be even more perfect at being a mum, or create a better house, or be a better cook, or put the face on and not let anybody see the fear and this just sort of lack internally that I felt. You know, it was quite, it was quite big. I assumed it was something that, when we've talked before, I had assumed before we were talking before, that it, it had come from the, it was a result of, you know, being in the, in the, in the public eye all of a sudden. But it's not before that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's definitely came from from. Ch I think most things for people, I think it could give us a bit of a predisposition. Our upbringing or, or vulnerability, if we want to use that word, vulnerability, <coughs> um, to things that happen later in life. So I think when we're children, we we build up. Um, we don't have the tools to deal with stress and and trauma and loss. And, and lack of nurturing. We, we're not equipped. So some kids go one way where they just constantly get into trouble or they go off the rails or other kids become pleasers. Generally, that's that's quite a common theme. They become, okay, how can I get the love that I need? So I grew up with, um, you know, I love my parents and I said this to you at the beginning, I certainly don't want this to be where I'm playing victim and I hate my parents, I don't. I love them dearly and they love me. And I always known they loved me and my siblings. They just made some quite catastrophic <laughs> errors in their choices. And I grew up with nine marriages 
between both parents. So my mum five times married, and my dad four times married. And we were very rarely consulted about those marriages. So just someone else would appear. Well, you're not married. You are. Oh, yeah, I am. My mum was, yes, yes, I have. I've married him. So to me, there was also that lack of respect. There was no involvement. There was no consultancy with us. But then we didn't know who was coming in from one minute to the next. And my mum worked tirelessly hard. You know, she had six kids. She didn't have a lot of support with her husbands, made very bad choices. So we had to grow up fast. So my role being number four out of six... And also, I think we are born either with an awareness or not. We gain awareness as we go through life. I think I, I genuinely was born with some sort of awareness. My mum said I was like a little old Buddha when I was born. I would sort of observe everything. You know, I was quite quiet. I, she said you would just be observing like you were soaking everything up around you. You know, which I find actually quite sad. You know, because I was quite sensible. I mean, that's all gone out the can now I'm older. I mean, my, my, you know, <laughs> I'm not sensible at all now. Um, but I was, I took the role on <clears throat> seeing all of the catastrophe going on around me to get love. I will try and fix everything. So take care of everything. Do things to please. What was, what do you mean, c c catastrophe? Were you moving a lot? Were you guys having to move a lot between the or um, no, we weren't moving loads. We moved maybe three or four times. Well, maybe three times up until the age of 15. But I, I guess one of the biggest things for me was when I was 15. So my three elder siblings had left home. Um, so there was me and my younger siblings who were, they had a different dad to me. Uh, and I had a lovely little dog. And then my mum had actually married my dad's brother gets even more complicated. My uncle is now my stepfather. And I'm going through my GCSEs. I live in Leighton Buzzard. And she said, you can, you know, you either come to America with me. I'm moving to America with your uncle and taking Claire and Philip and the dog. So my beloved dog, you know. Um, or you'll have to go and live in Luton with your dad. So I had to go and live with my dad in Luton. Leave your school. Now I had to then get a coach to school, which was like a two-hour coach drive. Every day? From Luton to school and do my GCSEs, yeah. But that actually isn't the point. The point for me was I'd spent 15 years almost <laughs> trying to do all these things to get approval, to get validation, to, be, to get that attention that I was literally craving for. You know, because I was sort of lower middle, so I wasn't the little babies and I wasn't the cream of the, you know, top of the tree who, you know, firstborns, generally, they, you know, they've got a bit more attention. So, and then I do believe there was just this, this just inbuilt nature to me, even from birth, where I've just had a little old wise head on my shoulders, you know, whereas my other brothers and sisters would get into trouble or have fun and do all the things that kids do. I was busy cutting my brother's hair, making my mum a birthday cake, taking care of things. So for my mum to leave me at 15 was like... She did leave? She went, yeah, she went then, yeah. She went and take my dog. I remember, I, I can remember it, looking at my dog, sobbing, thinking I'll never see you again. And you know what it's like with animals. I mean, especially when you've got, if you want to call it mental health issues or lack of nurturing in your upbringing, <clears throat> our animals are like our... Uh, you know, he was like everything. So I was crying as much for him going as my mother going. But what did that imprint in me at the age of 15? I'm not lovable. I'm not good enough. Whatever I do is not enough. And, you know, you feel abandoned. You know, you do you feel abandoned. Yes, I had a father to go to. But, you know, I'd seen my father in my upbringing once every two weeks with the odd little holiday thrown in. And I was in Luton. You know, having to travel two hours away from my mates. So, you know, it, it isn't something that I, you know, I don't spend my days thinking about this. I've dealt with it. I've, I've gone through many things to try and just sort of figure it all out. So I've spoken very briefly with my mum about it. You know, again, I'm not someone who's going to, you know, sling shit at people. 
she did her best. My my father's done his best. You know, they they aren't bad people. Did she come back? She... Yeah, she came yeah. back. Yeah. And then married somebody else. And then married somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah just you know so yeah it was uh interesting yeah interesting so what do you think so yeah so that imprint on you yeah not loved needed attention yeah not not good enough you know not good enough not good enough i'm left i'm abandoned i'm abandoned that was a big 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 pattern of behavior for me that would trigger me if i felt not loved or abandoned. So I tended to, so even in relationships, so, you know, when I sort of started dating, I generally, I remember my father saying to me, I'd hate to be one of your boyfriends because you literally, oh, after two weeks, don't, don't like them. No, don't, don't like them. Don't, that's another one gone. Because I would be looking for any reason to not get close. I wouldn't give them a chance to hurt me. Yeah, I didn't want them to hurt me. I didn't want to be dumped. I didn't want it. And it was sort of like, it was like my, my gold medal. I've never been dumped. The abandonment it's thing. never then. happened. Mm. Treat them mean, keep them keen. You be the one. And then I had had one long-term <laughs> relationship. I've never heard a woman say that. Treat them mean, keep them keep keen. keen. With men say, but not women. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was me. Sorry. You know. It was all very innocent. You know, I wasn't like, you know, getting up to stuff. It was sort of like, no, he's a bit boring. Okay, but he's wearing the wrong shirt. I would just be way too picky. And now I can see. I didn't then. Now I can see why I was doing it. The smallest excuse. Yeah, anything. So, and then I met my husband and uh, I just knew there was something about him that made me feel safe. What do you think that was? Um... Was he uh, in the public eye then? No. No. So before all that? Um, yeah, this is way before that. So we met when we were both on holiday and I... I don't know what... <laughs> you know, it sounds awful, doesn't it, when I say, God, I didn't look at him across the room and go, oh my God, he's amazing. <laughs> um, I just felt safe with him. I felt... I don't know what it was. It was an energy I got. I thought, I feel safe with you i feel safe so it wasn't like this sort of electric bolt of lightning and then eight weeks later we were engaged to be married he wasn't one after two weeks i thought "Mm -mm." i thought no there's something i need him in my life i need him in my life were you also aware at that point of what your partner behavior had been beforehand were you was that awareness coming because you spoke just now about knowing looking back on it now you know why you were getting rid of those people no i had no awareness back then i just thought god when am i going to meet anyone i actually really like you know i'm really picky i just sort of say i'm really picky you know it's like just just yeah super super picky um and now i can see it was a way of me protecting myself don't let anyone get too close then you can't get hurt And I, I think I'm much, much better with that. And believe me, I have had my heart broken. I have. I don't think you're human if you haven't gone through heartbreak. <clears throat> Whether it's w- within a relationship, it doesn't even need to be through that. It can be just losing a loved one, a relative, a pet, anything. We're all going to feel heartbreak. Um, but it, it's taken many, many years for me to now get to a point where I go, I think I finally know who I am. I think I finally know why I did those things. I think I finally know why I had those feelings about myself or behaviours, why I treated myself so badly. So that's something I really, for anybody listening, you know, when you feel anxious, what is it you tell yourself? Do you go, do you treat yourself with compassion? Do you speak gently to yourself? Or do you go, oh, you waste of space. You're so weak. These are all things that I used to say to myself. When actually living with it, my God, you've got to be tough as nails to live with it because it's so excruciating for people at times. I used to say to my husband, I wish I'd have my arms and legs cut off than live with this. It really is that bad. So for anyone who's, who's belittling themselves right now or berating themselves, you know, no, it's powerful that you're still opening your eyes, breathing, 
and trying to get through your day whatever way possible. I remember a doctor saying to me, Anna, if you get up and you walk to the shop and you feed your kids, pat yourself on the back. And I'd laugh at that. I'd be like, <laughs> you know, because I'm a doer. So for me to have it impact me so greatly <sighs> was really hard to accept. Because I'd, I'd spent all of those early years, probably the fun years of my life, check, you know, just looking after everyone else. And, you know, it's, 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 yeah, it was a long, long way for me to find the answers. Did that, <clears throat> after you met, after you met Darren, did that carry on? So, I mean, you sort of solved the relationship bit in terms of found someone you wanted to be with, but all the other pieces are the impacts of like, childhood and your anxiety. That carried on though, did it not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, did. Yeah, I moved up to Yorkshire. So did it manifest in itself in a different way then? Yeah, it did because it it was sort of different reasons, you know. So we moved up. To, we were living in Yorkshire, and then he became very good at what he was doing, playing cricket. Uh, <laughs> you couldn't write it, you know. He he got picked for England. I'm pregnant with our first child. He's going to be in Australia the day I'm giving birth. So what's that triggering for me? He's going to be gone for four and a half months. I'm having our first son. The thing I've longed for. It's like this another thing. I wasn't impacted by my upbringing where I didn't want kids. I was yearning for them. I wanted something of my own to love. <clears throat> so to me, we got married. I wanted a child straight away. I wanted something that was mine that I could really just give all of my love to. But then he's going to be in Australia. So it was it was sort of like, again, that 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 sort of, if you want to call it a beast, was starting to sort of start to pick up again. How so, far pregnant were you when you realised, when when you knew he was going to be away? Uh, well, when I found out, he was then selected for England a month later. Oh, my God. So I went through the whole pregnancy knowing he wouldn't be here, unless he broke a foot, which I was almost tempted to do, so he couldn't <laughs> go. <laughs> Believe me, I did. I did. We laugh about it now. I said, but do you remember when I was really quite serious? I thought I'll spade his foot in the garden or something on it by accident because I was terrified. But it wasn't just the terror of me not thinking. It wasn't just those sort of normal fears of what well, something happens in labour. You know, it's quite natural to think that he's, tw at, he's at least a day and a half away underlying and that's where it's like with anxiety look at start digging down don't look at necessarily the situation what is it actually if you sit with it where's it taking you back to where's it what's the cause why am i feeling this he's here even though he's well he's not here but when he left he's over there but he loves me everything's okay even if he was here there's very little he could do but what it was bringing up for me is I'm being abandoned again. I'm actually, um, his career was soaring, you know, so it was basically everywhere I went, everybody would just talk about him. So I'm becoming quite insignificant. So where does that take me back to? Mm. My childhood. So abandonment, I'm feeling insignificant because basically I'd be out and I'd be just pushed to the side by people. If you were with him? Yeah. Even if we're out with our kids, moving forward a few years, just, just, we're invisible. All people wanted was a picture or a chat. You know, so when you went out, you were almost on red alert because and me being a very naturally vigilant person anyway, I'm always hyper vigil. I'd be sort of like, right, he's looking, uh, okay. Oh, oh, no, they've spotted us. Oh, jeez. You know, and I'd be muttering under my breath to Darren, Get, just get the boys, get the boys, you know, let's just move in the opposite direction. I just want some space. So this is when he was at his peak. You know, it's not like that now. Uh, things have really quietened down now. But there were all of these sort of just little things that would come in that would just take me back to the root cause, which was in the upbringing. I mean, that situation in itself for anyone would bring about levels of anxiety and insecurity. Mm. You know, not uh, without the, <clears throat> the upbringing piece. <clears throat> is that a common issue? I mean, is that a, a common experience 
with other people in your situation, as in, I say your situation, as in married or partnered or close to someone who's in the public eye and then having to deal with that sort of perception of being insignificant and what that brings with it. Yeah, I mean, it, it it's not something that I generally, most of my friends aren't cricket wives. Um, you know, it's not like the military where you're all sort of closer together and uh, we were spread out all over the country. So it, they, I can't say I've really had those close conversations, but I've got a very close friend of mine who's, you know, husband um, <clears throat> is away half the month. So that's six months a year. It equates to, yeah, you know, she'd understand what that feels like. But I think it was more, it was more sort of, it was the length of time, those large chunks that he'd be gone. And then adjusting to when he came back, then he would be home for a month and then the English cricket season would start and then he'd be gone again. There was never any, um, there never felt like there was any stability. And I only mean that in the, in the sense of as far as being a family, because he was always packing a bag. And I, I'll be really honest, even now, like he's in India at the moment, he's only gone for four days. It's not the four days that I worry about. It's when I see him packing a bag now, I I almost can't watch him pack a bag because it takes me. I'm not having a panic attack. I'm not even getting anxious. There's just something in me that just starts to feel a bit uncomfortable because for so many years, for so many months, I would just watch him. It's just constant suitcase, suitcase, suitcase packing. by, by, by Christmas, New Year, kids' birthdays, never home, never home. You know, it was just gone. But do you know what? The, I think the most difficult thing was there was very little empathy from anybody because it gave us a nice lifestyle. You know, so, you know, what we were talking about earlier about let's not look at things. Let's look at our internal bodies because actually external things aren't going to make us happy. They, they very rarely do. They might temporarily. It's like with anything. You have a drink, you might feel a bit more relaxed for a few minutes any habits we do that possibly aren't overly helpful, they give you a quick fix, but they're not the long-term answer. So, you know, I think it's... I'm trying to think where I was going with that. He... It was never... It was never his fault. So, you know, again, I don't want people here going, well, you know, you had a nice lifestyle out of it. And I'm not saying he abandoned me. He didn't. He gave, he's given us an amazing life. He also has his own traumas from leaving his family for months, not being present for birth of his kids. You know, the work he was doing, having to be under so much pressure, you know, in front of all those people. So um, it, was a, it was a mutual thing, but we both had to sort of accommodate and try and make the best out of a very difficult situation. But I think when you have these external things, as in decent car, nice house, what she got to feel unhappy about? What she got to be anxious about? It's sort of like all of those things, like thirty pressmen coming into your hospital room uh, or into the canteen in the hospital ward, and the embarrassment I felt at all the other women who have given birth being moved out after their lunch because I've got to go in and do a press conference. That made me cringe, but I'm being directed that I've got to do it by the cricket club. I have got to show a picture of my son at 22 hours old for the papers because it's the first day of the Australian test match that he was born and I have to do it. And I'd literally just been in tears about two hours before just because he had a rash and, you know, the mind was just going, I just don't want to do it. You know, your hormones are going nuts, your milk's coming in. You know, you're just, you just don't want to put the face on. And for me, I found that hugely triggering because I'm, I'm angry. At this point, I'm feeling anger because all I want is them to leave me, excuse my French, the fuck alone. At the point of the press conference. Yeah. It's like, fuck, just leave me alone. But I knew if I didn't, they'd follow me home. And they'd sit outside ask, my house. How much control did they is that, is that, is that, is that If you don't get it done then, they're going to find a they way will to do fi it. They'll just park outside my house. Yeah, they'll park outside the house. Which they did the day Darren came back from... <laughs> Australia so he left when I was 34 weeks pregnant and then I was due to fly but then he injured himself and I knew he'd be coming home so Liam was about eight weeks or nine weeks old then so probably three months had passed three and a half months 
he ended up leaving the tour coming home and we just lived in a little two up two down it's our little starter home um it was carnage in a little cul-de-sac you know there's a policeman on my front door it's like what on earth is going on he hasn't seen his baby hasn't held his baby yet he, I'm, I'm having to tell him to draw the curtains they are all over the place not even considering just leave them alone so i stuck in the back door you know where no one can see us and we had to keep the curtain shut for a couple of days they didn't leave you know i even cr cracked a joke i thought i'll throw a pair of my knickers out the top bedroom window in a minute and then they'll soon clear off <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> there you go um but that was just my you know funny try and be funny sense of humor but i just found it so there were so many aspects of it that were just so uncomfortable to me I was just me, but yet there was this sort of pressure to, again, the pressure of probably my husband's job, and this isn't blaming him, this isn't, I've been fully supportive of everything he's done, and very proud of what he's achieved, but it comes at a price, you know. Were, were you afraid of, um, of your children having similar experience to what you had or thoughts of abandonment and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I was. Yeah. So, so what, what did that make me become? What, what that said to me was I have to be really, really good at this job. I've got to be mother, father, you know, playmate, cook, best chef, very entertaining. 24 7 sleepless night i've got to be it i didn't want to leave my kids with a nanny people saying you can afford it get a nanny go to work no i didn't want to leave my kids with a nanny i wanted them to have everything that i wasn't able to be given growing up so going back to the upbringing again if i hadn't have had that upbringing i might have gone yeah do you know what? i'm gonna to go to work i'm gonna to go to work they'll be fine i'll get a nanny i'll get my career going my brain is very active it needs to be worked, otherwise it runs into trouble because then I've got too much time to think. I've got too much time to focus on unhelpful things and that is where I was. So, yes, I was super busy. I was with a tiny little baby and a toddler. But actually, the, the repercussions of that were it wasn't stimulating distraction, if you want to call it. So there was no, there was no um, stimuli for me. I was I was a stay-at-home mum and I don't regret a minute of that because I'm so pleased I've been able to sort of have that time and that relationship with my sons. But I would often worry, more so as they get older, about the impact that perhaps it may have on them, you know, not having him there. Because I think when they're babies, as long as they've got, you know, they've got one of you and they've got lots of love, I think generally they're okay. And when Darren was home, I'd very much... I think he found it quite difficult, if I'm honest, to switch back on, you know, into family life. So, you know, that would take a little bit of coaxing, but I would very much encourage him to do the bathing, putting them to bed, spending that time with them, because I just thought it was so important um, for him to be able to have that quality time with them, because before we knew it, he'd be gone again for another four months. So, so yeah, it is something I was very aware of. And is it also, was there also a danger, not a danger, the impact of, although it was great having him back, it's also a disruption to your routine, that is what you've got most of the time? Yeah, yeah. Because he would, you know, after a couple of days, you know, you've got over the honeymoon period, he'd say, I am home, because I'd be sat there, like, because that was my communication back then. Talking to friends on the phone in the evening, kids are in bed, having a bit of a laugh. Because I didn't really see anybody. I was up in Yorkshire. I'd see Darren's parents and family, but didn't really see many people. So for me, it was that, um, yeah, I'd be like, oh, God, I forgot. So it did take adjusting for both of us, as wonderful as it was, to get back to being a family again. And and it it's quite unusual because while there's just me you're sort of in that routine and you're very disciplined. Whereas when you have your partner come home, 
you it does it sort of completely muddies the waters a little bit because you're like oh well, I don't really have to do that you know because I've got them around and they can do it so it did take some time to to figure out how that routine was going to work where the kids would get good time with him as well but he was he was really good he was very hands-on just the odd time you know I'd have to give him a bit of a little bit of a boot up his bum <laughs> just very gently but yeah you know he needed a bit of encouragement um how did uh how did you first get into the the mindfulness and the well-being and the mental health toolbox stuff then it was that literally from just being introduced to yoga during that period of your life or was it or were you did you end up actively looking for something it, it was actively looking for something because i think for me you know yeah i saw doctors i had counseling I did medication you know and i i not ashamed to admit that i think for some people it can be very helpful and it certainly helped me so uh but then i started to sort of it, we build a reliance on doctors and other people and I thought, no, I don't. I, I want to start. That can work really well with things that I can start researching. So it doesn't mean you've got to let that go, because there's a place for medicine and there's a place for holistic in my eyes. And you have to do whatever you need to get through every day. So I'm not going to be on any anything I talk about where I go, no, 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 medication, there's no place for it. No, 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 you've got to be vegan. <laughs> just that just is not me whatsoever you know to me medicine and holistic work really well especially if it's something quite chronic which for me it was at the time it really helped save my you know not that I had any intentions of doing anything but to gain control and quieten down my my busy manic mind and it was just, I was diagnosed with generalised anxiety disorder. Also PTSD, was throat, which slightly alarmed me. So I thought, what, what do you mean, PTSD? What, what, are you, what are you talking about? And they said, just when you go through, I had some very intensive counselling where I went through, and we've only scratched the surface here. <laughs> we don't have time to talk about everything. But when I went through everything, they said all of those layers of trauma have finally just definitely made it sort of so big trauma throughout your life yeah or from childhood or, or all the way through sort of to the point where the diagnosis came but but by this point i was sort of um i had those tools in place thank god you know i had those tools in place so it wasn't where i was going oh my god you know there was nothing it was just like oh okay well i sort of knew really anyway I think it was just to, to have somebody, I didn't even really need it validating. It, it, it's just something that I probably would never have wanted to talk to anybody about because to me, I think I haven't been in a war zone. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't been on a battlefield. Nothing, you know, that, 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 that's trauma. But the more I've sort of digged into this, the more research I've done, the more books I've read, it doesn't have to be that. And I think I only say that for people who haven't been in that situation, who are, have got their beating sticks out right now going, I'm weak as weak as any, I'm, I'm pathetic, I'm useless, I'm no good. No, 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 don't let that go. Let that go. Because trauma can be can impact people on different levels. It doesn't matter what it is. It's a trauma. It's an event. It's how your body then and your mind processes that trauma is how you're going to come out of it. Because when we're hit with trauma, our autonomic system gets dysfunctional. Our breathing patterns become dysregulated. Then we start with that horrible the stress response, the fight or flight, the constant vigilance that we're, we're living in. So... Lots of reading of books, Hugh, tons of listening to just, I mean, back then, CDs, things on the radio. I was like a, a sponge. I wanted to learn as much as I could. Probably the breathing stuff came in for me, maybe, I mean, yeah, I was doing it in yoga, but probably seriously where I was engaging in it myself, maybe five or six years ago, um, when I had a little bit of a wobble with anxiety. <clears throat> 
And then, yeah, just everything else has just sort of fallen into place. But if you ask me what's in my toolbox, which I think would be quite an interesting question, is podcasts. I love a good podcast. But I could suggest a couple. <laughs> obviously. What's he called again? Is it H Happy Hour? H R Happy Hour. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's happy hour, that's what it means. Yeah, happy H hour, something yeah. hour. Yeah. Um, love a good podcast. And it doesn't mean it's got to be a podcast on mental health or emotional. It's about everything. It's about life. Love a good podcast. Books. There's so many free resources for people out there and again I only share this so that if there's people out there who can't afford counselling who can't afford to see a psychiatrist who can't afford a private doctor there's so many resources if you google literally anything there'll be something there for you that will be able to give you something that doesn't cost you much nature is in my wellness toolbox getting outside community you know just immersing myself in nature, walking barefoot, I don't care if that sounds hippie-ish, being outside, listening to the trees, just laying on the grass, getting my hands dirty, you know, digging things, growing things, meditating. But when I say meditating, I can't do the silent meditating. I have to have a talking visualisation going on because my mind is still, when I'm, it's never not going to be busy. But that is, it's like storytelling through meditation for me. So I really like that. Um, what else? What else? What else? Exercise. Exercise. The cold baths, ice baths. But then I'll be looking for, but then I have sort of a, an open section. So the open section is what's next. So when that what's next, it's, it's what will push me into a fear state in a good way that I can challenge myself with that will arm me emotionally and help me in my daily life. And that's what I hate for people, whether they come to me or any of the other brilliant cold water therapists up and down the country now, is that when they step foot and they lower themselves down into that tank or lake or wherever they are, the sea, and they feel that burn, they feel that discomfort, but they know that they can really control that fear response, that they remember that and they take that into their daily life when they leave me or when they leave anybody. Once they've done it, once, twice, three times, that is my wish. You're also achieving something. Mm. So one of the, I think one of the, people tend to talk a lot about, especially people with a lot of anxiety or depression, they talk a lot about, quite often talk about a sense of purpose and all that, especially mm. Ex-military or anyone who's done who did something for a long time in their life and now they can't do that anymore mm. for whatever reason. And one, so I have two. I have in, in the military, I have a thing called immediate action drills, IA drills. Mm. So if your weapon stops working, there's an IA drill for what you do if yeah, your weapon yeah, yeah. stops shooting. Yeah, right? that other stuff. Yeah, and I have IA for if my own mental state is not where I want it to be. Maybe that's really experiencing bad anxiety, really feeling stressed, really feeling not happy. Like last 48 hours, I've been just, just almost in a depressive state. I do. Just, uh, it, honest, it, I, I completely, state. I completely understand. And yeah. the, and not because you were coming. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't because you were coming. I, I've, while you were saying that, I thought, okay, well, no, hold on. I, I, uh, I, I know why. building up to, <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> But I know why it is. But my IA drill, because quite a lot, one of the problems is most of the, most of the time, people cannot pinpoint what the problem is. So mm. they go, "How do I fix it?" And, and most of the time, that's the case for everybody. You can't. It's very difficult to pinpoint. So mm. my anxiety comes on. Your anxiety comes on. That's because of a multitude of mm. factors. Factors are happening now. Mm. Historical factors, mm. internal factors, external factors. You can't and you can't fix all those. Mm. But my IA drill is one of two things. It's I either change my environment or I do something hard. And the easiest one is change my environment. And that is as simple as walk outside, walk down the canal, go get outside. Most of the time it's get outside. Go and just do yeah. that. Literally change the environment I'm in. And the other one is do something hard. And that's why I love the ice bath. I have been cold showering on and off recently, but I was doing it since 
September, October last year. And it's less about the physiological impact of yeah. it, like the health benefits. Yeah. It is more, for me, it's more about it's doing something hard. When you challenge yourself and go, I'm going to do something hard, yeah. which means you dislike it and you're yeah. going to go and, do, and you do it, you've achieved something there. Yeah. You've achieved something. Yeah. People with a lot of anxiety, depression, a lot of instances of, of different types of mental yeah. health. They fucking hate themselves. Yeah, they they think they're worthless. They think they're worthless. It's horrible. And yet, demonstrating value is so close. It's so easy to achieve. Mm. So, and your example of everyone's got access to cold water. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everyone. Uh, you know, we all do. But you know what? What you were talking? You know, something you said there just reminded me to say something because I think anxiety is like a disease. It is like it's like the pandemic. Anxiety is absolutely just running havoc. And I have a lot of people come to me with anxiety. And the one thing I say to them is, it's the biggest lie you're ever going to face in your life. The biggest? Liar. Go on. It is. It tells us lies, doesn't it? Because when we're anxious, we catastrophize. So, so if I think of... Some of the things that I've got anxious about. So say, you know, I'm anxious about my health or, you know, I've had some health anxiety or something. Oh, God, I'm going <laughs> to die of cancer. Oh, God, you know, I must have this wrong with me. That's, what's, that's why my head's been going. Have I got it? No. Generally, when I look, and I read this in a book, and I thought, wow, that's really powerful. It is the biggest lie you're ever going to meet in your life over any human being. Because if I look at my life... It's the biggest lie I've ever ha ever had in my life, in how I talk to myself, in how I've treated myself, in how I've valued myself, in how I've seen myself. It's the it's the biggest lie I've ever faced. So I said, if you can try and just keep that in your mind, next time you hear that little voice come in and feed you basically a line of shit. Because that's what it does. It's trying to keep you. It's trying to keep you safe. It's putting. It's trying to keep you small. It's trying to stop you from growing, and it thinks it's keeping you safe. Because when we're anxious, we're like it keeps us small. I used to not even want to go to the shops to go and get food shopping. So I'm like, oh, I can't even go to the shop. I can't go to the supermarket. They, that was a massive trigger for me. What was this? What were you scared of? Just people, noise, people. I still don't like really busy places, if I'm honest. But I, that isn't. I think that's just my nature. I love countryside. I love space, and I think people with busy minds generally don't like being around really crowded. The idea of hell for me is being on Oxford Street on a Saturday afternoon. I mean, my girlfriends know. Don't ever ask me to do shopping in London, <laughs> ever. I never get invites now. Okay, and I call it oh NFIs, no fucking invite because. <laughs> I don't get invited because that is, I'd rather, I'd rather be locked in my bedroom all day than do that. It just does not, I need open space because open space makes me feel more spacious inside. I'm, I'm very, I pick up on energy with people. So if I'm surrounded by people and it's busy and it's because I'm trying to pick up everything that's going on around me, you know, I, my mind just gets too busy. Have you tried paddleboarding? No, but I, that's on my list. That's in my, you know, the left, right hand side of my sandwich box. Yeah, that's on it in my wellness toolbox. You got a sandwich box in the toolbox? <laughs> that's outrageous. <laughs> I, need to, I need to upgrade my toolbox. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah, I know. I've sort of changed the name of it. So that's in my, that's in my, what did I call that one? The sort of the side section. The tray. The tray. That's in my to do tray. You know, still to happen. So that is on there. Yeah. So I've got a friend who lives down in Devon. Um, who paddle boards, so I'm going to go and do something cold water there. dip at the same time. Yeah. So my missus in, introduced me to paddle boarding a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah. Man, we love it. Yeah. Love it. Everyone I know who does it says the same. So, yeah, that's definitely... In fact, I'm doing a festival in... Uh, I'm doing the ice water therapy at a festival in June. Oh, yeah. Big oh, retreat. we were talking about this. The big treat in Pembrokeshire. Yeah. When in June is it? Third to the 6th. Jubilee weekend. So, and so I'll be doing the ice boat. But anyway, I'm going to do paddle boarding there because they're going to have that going on there. So I'm going to skip that. across and have a go. You yeah. 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 So, yeah, that is on my little thing to do. Um, when you decided to set up um, 
breathing tree. Mm. Was there a little piece of you that said, do I want the stress of meeting people's expectations with this? No. No. Is there a stress of getting the business in? Yeah. <clears throat> do I feel stress at how I conduct my sessions? No. I feel really comfortable with making people feel comfortable. So people can come to me either really relaxed. Some can come just in a, what I call, really homeostatic state, very sort of balanced, neither up nor down. Some can come, you know, hyper. Some can come tearful, actually literally tearful. And I feel that just because of this wellness journey, if you want to call it that, that I've been on, which has been really quite intense. You know, we haven't had enough time to even scratch the surface. You know, I've done really quite intense retreats on myself where I've really had to go inside and look at the shadows, the internal shadows and what's going on. So I think that's given me a skill set where it doesn't matter how you show up. I'm going to make you feel really comfortable. We might even have a little bit of a laugh. But is that because you've probably been really there? Is that yeah. you've probably been in their shoes? Yeah, Listen. I can feel it. I can I can tell the minute someone walks over my doorstep how they're feeling. I can sense it. It's like, okay, this is how I feel I need to... How was I feeling when I turned up? Your palms are sweaty, so I think you're quite nervous. Were they? Yeah. How did you... We shook hands and I thought, oh, he's a bit tense. His hands are a bit sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing gloves next time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but do you know what? I don't, it, it's not, mine, mine are sweaty actually now because I probably was a bit nervous doing this, but that's all right. <laughs> Makes us human. Um, no, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. I love what I do. I absolutely love what I do. For what reasons did people come to you? I mean, why was, why was that person crying when they turned up? Uh, she got lost. And then she, she was struggling with anxiety as well. So her, she was already very triggered by the anxiety. And then you get lost and road diversions, you can start crying. So she was quite emotional. So I spent a bit more time getting her settled, getting her, you know, comfortable. And I think, I don't think that's a skill that anybody can just do. And I don't think it's really something you can learn either. I think it's either you've had things happen and, and then you've just, built this awareness this inner awareness um so no i don't get nervous when people come uh i guess when i do the bigger retreats you know that that's all about timing so you get a bit stressed about making sure the timings all work and the food is all great and perfect and so yes do i get a bit stressed with that yes i am human making sure the fires are going just just making sure but the the smaller sessions even that bit is gone. Do I get excited about the work? Yes. Every single time somebody even now steps foot, I can feel that adrenaline rush because I know what it's going to feel like when they get in, but more so when they get out as well. I was going to say, yeah, it's one of those where yeah. you can guarantee, you can guarantee for 99.9% .9 of people that come to you and experience that, yeah. they are gonna, they're going to be in a more positive state than when they walk through the door yeah you know and and obviously i've my experience there and, and that's uh that's because of the nature of the thing that you're doing the breathing techniques the the cold water and even more so when people do it for the first time never done it before mm. and or are skeptical yeah because that's like a double bonus yeah, <laughs> it's yeah like a double it is bonus. yeah it is because yeah. they're uh, it, it, uh, you know, the, it's. It, I, I, I like to think when people come, that they just they feel looked after. You know that I'm approachable. Like you say, you can have a laugh. I'm serious when I need to be serious, but I'll crack a joke. You know, I just like being around people who come to me because generally they've got. I think I said this to you when you were with me. Generally, people who come here have a story. And by that, I mean they've been through some stuff. Or they're going through some stuff. They yeah. have an openness to I them. I think that's everyone, though, Anna. I think that's everyone. I think they have a awareness, then, or an openness to them that perhaps somebody who goes, oh, no, I could never do that. People are nuts who do that. It's not saying mm. they don't need mm. it. Mm. 
they haven't got that inner awareness or, uh, I don't know, drive or willingness perhaps to step into the fear. I don't know. Because I think it, yes, of course, it's going to oh, benefit everybody. Mean, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I've got loads yeah. of mates who are going, you're never getting me doing that. Yeah, I see what you mean. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Because uh, the point I was making is everyone, everyone, has a, everyone has a story. I wholeheartedly believe that. Yeah. Everyone has their traumas, their distresses, their horrible experiences in life. I truly believe that. Everyone, yeah. everyone does. Um, and some people will talk about it. Some people, some people don't want to. Some people need to. Some people don't need to. Some people are completely comfortable with it. And then, yeah, on to you. Know, and then there are people who who are looking for something and they take a step forward to do it. It's, it's admirable. I really think it's admirable in people who are, honestly, people who are willing to go and get in a fucking ice bath for the first time because <laughs> it is not, like, I, I was nervous getting into that thing. Well, before when I stood on the side, I thought, oh my God. And the only reason I, wa I wasn't there, standing there for another two or three yeah. minutes, pep talking myself, because she was stood there, I thought, I'm not going to press myself. <laughs> I'm going to get in. I'm going to get in. Oh my God. Is that and you're yeah. not going to get yeah. out. You know, uh, but I mean, I mean the other one on on the on the anxiety thing on the the subject of anxiety we've, we've talked about a lot today, and I, and there's probably people who listen or watch this, and I, there's a lot of people who are skeptical when you say, oh, stuff about anxiety, and I have been in the past before I had my own experiences and think, fucking anxiety, get a get a grip of yourself, especially mm -hmm. when I was serving, get a grip of yourself, and what I know now is, my God, it is one of the most debilitating things mm. I have ever experienced, ever experienced, mm. ever. It's mm. so debilitating. Me too. And to your point, it's 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 almost all within your mind. Mm. You know, we were talking about earlier about perception of what's going on around you, the subjectivity of um, yeah, how, how subjective trauma is. Mm. One, one person's trauma is another person's <laughs> yeah. just another day. Didn't even notice anything. Yeah. People can get PTSD, a tr ex like a real traumatic experience yeah. from Nearly getting hit by a car. Yeah. Not getting hit by a car. Nearly getting hit by a car. Yeah. Most people nearly get hit by a car. If I can sound, yeah. Like, oh, I'm all right. Yeah. Now. You know, and uh, and that's a really important lesson to learn, especially for people like you who mm. don't have that. Oh, I'm I'm not ex-military background. It can't possibly be affecting. Well, yourself with PTSD. Like you say, you've never been in a, a battle or anything like mm. that. It doesn't it doesn't have mm. to be that to mm. the point of just making. And that the thing is, it's like you know, I don't think it's necessary to, for me to drone on and go through every single life stage. It's not necessary. I certainly don't really want to talk about every single little thing. I don't think it's helpful. It's done. It's dealt with. But it just sort of helps you understand yourself a bit more instead of being so self-critical. Because, you know, like you said earlier, that anxiety, God, the self-loathing, you know, the self-sabotaging. I still have a bit of self-sabotage. You know, so if I do, say, a live on Instagram and my husband will go, God, that was right on point. He said, how do you just do it? And you're funny and I go, I didn't say that word properly. I mispronounced that. And yet I'm getting loads of messages going, you were really funny, you should be on TV. I mean, which is lovely, you should be on TV, you're hilarious, really knowledgeable as well, really good fun, really love what you do. Oh God, I didn't pronounce that word properly. It's authentic, though. It's authentic. People are crying out for authenticity yeah. in what they're viewing, what they're watching, what they're listening, who they're paying attention to, crying out for authenticity. Yeah. They really are, especially for the last couple of years. Yeah, exactly. And that's why it's popular. Yeah. <laughs> that's why people, that's why people like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing one tomorrow, actually. I'll try to yeah. talk properly, but anyway. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, you know, it is. It's about. Uh, I'm just being really open by saying that I'm not. When people go, "Oh, you seem to have all your shit together now," I'm much better than I was. But I think for all of us, it's it's work in progress every day. We've got to be mindful that we just don't want to slip back. We don't want to slip back to where to where it was. So I'm certainly that that. You know, the lid on my box is, is always unlocked. It's never put away. It's never shut down. The key's never thrown away. It's basically unlocked. So I access that every day. And I really mean it when I say when I get home from this session, I will be getting in that ice water. And some people say, that's lunatic. Why is it loony? It's 10 minutes. But I'll go, oh, great. I'm ready. Hmm. You know, and that's what I need. And other people will find other things they need. But there are things... There are so many things for people, and I do think it is a really important thing to keep highlighting when we talk about anxiety, because I think the mental health, you know, NHS are absolutely, they're bursting. 
I know people are having to wait 16 months to be reviewed. They're not in a great place now. They're really in trouble. They can't wait 16 months, but they can't afford to see someone private. I find that utterly desperate because I put myself in their shoes. I think, oh, my God, I remember being that bad. Oh, my God, if I couldn't have afforded. So please do some Googling. There's loads of groups. There's loads of there's Just do whatever you can. If you're a family member, a loved one, there's so much free support you can access. You know, even if it's little support groups, just so you have someone you can speak to. Because sometimes it doesn't have to be a psychologist or a doctor. Sometimes it's speaking to somebody else who has it that can be just as much, if not sometimes more powerful. Because then, even by you and I having this mutual exchange, I come away from here and we've created sort of that bond I know that you've had your struggles. You know I've had my struggles with human being. I don't think any less of you. You don't think any less of me. Apart from I think less of you because you kept calling me Amanda. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not today, though. No, I don't today. Um, so I, I think it's really important to sort of just keep saying, just do do all the research you can. There, there are some things out there for people. And if anybody wants to get in touch with me, I don't know whether you put links on. I, I will always try to my utmost to reply if they want me to point them any of the directions that I know of that are free and accessible um, to them. So how do people, how do people follow what you're doing? How do people look at, uh, look at breathing tree and uh, yeah, all, all the links, what all the links? Okay. Oh, crikey. Okay. So website, the, the website, website. www.breathingtree.life. Life, L-I-F-E. life, L I F E. Cool. I know. And then uh, Instagram is at Breathing Tree. So that's t- uh, Breathing Tree Two One um, at Breathing Tree Twenty One. And then I'm on Facebook as well, but that I'm not really that active on Facebook and LinkedIn. I just can't get my head around that. It's too corporate. Um, so basically, Instagram is the best place to get a hold of me. There's contact numbers on there, and you can DM me. And um, you I'll know, put the, I'll put the link in the, yeah. in the blog. So if anyone's got any questions, I'll, I'll reply. What is Breathing Tree providing services-wise? Uh, so two different modalities of breath work. So I'm an oxygen advantage um, teacher or instructor. So that works on, that's probably a little bit more for people who are asthmatic, long COVID sufferers, um, athletes who want to improve their endurance, um, that involves much more methodical, sort of on a track or in person or, you know, it's not quite so lay down and get comfy and I'll take you on a journey. It's it's much more structured um, and I give you specific exercises to do each day to build up your um, <coughs> endurance, really. Um, but that's still really good for people with anxiety as well. But if people want the much softer approach, then I do that. Um, I'm a pranayama breath teacher as well and then ice water bathing well you've been there there's i've got the retreat space so i've got the studio space i can either do one-to-ones i can do couples i could do come with a mate i could do a group of lads if they wanted to come four of them group of girls mixed well, on that, I know you want to organize, we'll talk about yeah. after this, we want to organize something for the met- military community, so yeah. people can then experience it, which we will try and sort them out, Yeah, 100%. So on that note, people, um, if you're on Instagram, follow uh, follow Anna, because I'm sure that those details will get posted on there at some point on the website. And thank you for actually, thank you for suggesting that, actually. So right. um I honestly think, you know, with the ice water thing, it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but it is definitely something I think everyone should try once. Especially, you know, we're talking, we talk a lot about the mental health toolkit here. We're talking a lot about self-help and people who are waiting to go and get seen for whatever, whatever your background, whatever situation. The self-help stuff is, it, it is self, called self-help for a reason. It literally, there's loads of stuff out there. Have a look at, like Anna was saying, Google. Go on Google and have a look. And if something, if you think, all you have to do is look at something. Okay, I'm willing to try that. Okay, and just try that. It may work for you, it may not. If it works for you, it's going to do one of two things. It's either going to improve the situation you're in slightly to make it a bit more bearable until you can get professional help if you need it, or it may even fix the situation for you. Mm. It may even fix the situation you just don't know. You don't mm. know. Anna, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Breathing tree. 
Anna Goff. Breathing Tree 21. Patreon podcast. One. The sandwich tin in the mental health toolbox. Yeah, this, yeah. Let's, Amanda, uh, really. Let's <laughs> go get food. Thank you very oh, much for your time. You're welcome. That's it. Thank you for watching Hey Chower. If you enjoyed this episode, why not become a Hey Chower patron? Hey Chower patrons get exclusive access to premium content with guests like the one you just watched. There are private interviews with previous guests and with this guest that nobody will see except for the Hey Chower patrons. So before this podcast was recorded, I recorded an exclusive Q&A, a shorter interview structured around eight questions. All the questions were chosen by patrons beforehand, and that interview is online now for patrons. That happens every time. Patrons also get access to all of the episodes before anyone else. They get advanced viewing of the episodes. And you also get other perks and bonuses. All of the information is on charliecharlie1.com. Just hit the menu item, become a patron. It'll show you everything there, including access to the H Hour Discord community and private patron-only channels on there. So go to charliecharlie1.com and hit the menu item, become a patron. Easy peasy. If you prefer to listen to your podcast normally, H Hour is also on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's on all of the podcast apps. And if you don't even want to bother with a podcast app, you can go to the, the H Hour website, charliechannel1.com, and you can actually play the podcast, video or audio, directly through the website, through your browser. Simples. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a supporter. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will catch you on the next episode. Thank you.